Yo, hands if you are excited, the best is yet to come. Let's appreciate our music ministry, our worship leaders, our organists, drummers, lead, bass, guitars. Thank God for them. And if any of you are musicians or singers, they are so excited to welcome you to join them. They meet on Thursdays at 7 p.m. And uh, you can come and just plug right on in. Uh, they would welcome your gifts in all of their manifestations. Amen? And uh, I think it'll be a great, great blessing. Turn with me then to our Bibles, Matthew chapter number four. We're going to jump right into our time of preaching. I think uh, a couple of things, other observations I probably should notice while you're turning there. This Tuesday is voting day. Voting day. Did you know that? March 3rd is the Super Tuesday California primary. And we are in desperate need of all of us to make sure that we show up to the polls and let our voices be heard on these very important issues uh, that are <coughs> uh, rolling up for us. The nomination for the Democratic, uh, 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 the nominee for the Democratic Party for the President of the United States will uh, be determined or selected uh, tomorrow by some many of our California votes. Uh, there are also in other parts of the state uh, very important um, elections related to district attorneys and prosecutors and judges and all kinds of things that directly impact the issues that our congregation and many of us have been working on for quite some time. And so uh, I know that it is a very, very important um, election season. And if you're like me, I wish uh, the general election would just be tomorrow so we could just get on with it. Amen. <laughs> And, and just be clear about what kind of enemy we're going to have to <laughs> wrestle against uh, for the next few years. Uh, but we have a process. Somebody say we got a process. And it is our responsibility to engage the process. And let me just also say this. Um, I was uh, in a conversation with some young activist friends, and they were talking about uh, the, 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 uh, the, the ways in which older people, I guess, I, I don't know if they were talking about me just yet. <laughs> it's a mean thing, amen, because you know, in my mind, I'm young. <laughs> then you talk to young peop younger people and you realize, I think you kind of throw a shade at me. And I remember about 10 years ago, I was the one talking the way they talk, so life's a funny thing. But they talked about how this, uh, you know, kind of generation of of why Gen voters and, and millennial voters uh, were gonna overtake the, the X Gen and boomer voters and, and we were gonna usher in this whole new era of all kinds of things. And, uh, and I, I was very compelled by, by their argument until I've seen some of the election returns. And it comes to mind that uh, we who consider ourselves to be younger talk a good talk but don't seem to show up when it's time to put your five on it, your, your hands. Somebody say amen, right? Like, you know, some of us, we say, oh, I'm a vote, I'm a vote, I'm a vote. And then you wake up in the morning and you're late to work or you have to work through your lunch break or you get to the polling line and it's too long a line and then you just go home or you don't vote. And meanwhile, many of the elders, they'll stand in line two, three, four hours to vote. And so what I would like to encourage us to do, many of us who are in this room, um, let's start exercising a muscle of resilience in our participation of stewarding this country that we are all called to live in until we're not. I know many of us, you know, we want to be expatriates, you know, want to expatriate. I want to go live like, you know, other folk and, and live, live the last 10 years of my life in another country. Man, I'm looking forward to that too. But until I do, tell your neighbor, we got to steward the one we're in. And so if we do not vote tomorrow and if we don't call our friends, we say arrive with five at the polls. Don't just go by yourself, but take some folk with you and vote. If you don't like to vote for the presidential candidates, vote down the ballot. Vote for mayors and prosecutors and judges and, and school board members. All of your votes count so much more powerfully at the local level. Is that all right, everybody? And if you don't know who to vote for, arrive with five people and y'all vote for the same person. 
Amen. You know, read up. Go on Google. You read all the other summaries from your favorite shows, and you know, read the gossip, the the was a gossip, and 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 World Star. Amen. We're gonna put some ads on World Star in this election cycle. So while you while you over there in that stuff, you're gonna hear about some other stuff. The Shade Room. Somebody say Amen, right? Mm -hmm. We're gonna do that. Maybe not by Tuesday, but we are going to have to make sure we vote. Is that all right? So give your neighbor a high five and tell them, please vote on Tuesday, please. We have early voting. Vote, 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 vote. And then after you vote, we're going to have to keep doing our justice and stewardship work of creation to make sure we have the kind of world that God intended when God created all of this and left it in our hands to steward. Amen? All right, Matthew chapter number four is where we're heading. The book of Matthew is uh, one of uh, these gospel records that was crafted and told with the audience of Jewish people in mind. Uh, it is one of these uh, collection of the early uh, teachings and life of Jesus that intended to ensure that the readers of this particular gospel were able to make connections to their cultural heritage, to the prophecies. As Jews, they were expecting a Messiah. And they were attempting to try to help make clear that the Jesus of Nazareth was actually uh, the fulfillment of prophecies that for millennia were preparing them for a liberation experience, a salvation experience, of both the soul, the mind, the body, and the spirit. And so as we journey into our season of Lent, we're going to talk a little bit about a journey to belong using this particular Lenten passage. Every year when Lent comes around, uh, you know, some of the first passages all across Matthew, Mark, Luke uh, that are lifted up for Lent are the passages that tell us the story of Jesus being led by the Spirit into the wilderness. And so we're going to talk a little bit about uh, this journey to belong as seen through Jesus' journey through the wilderness led by the Spirit. And verse number one tells us in Matthew chapter four, it may be on the screen, Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. I just want you to just trip at all of the different uh, hmm, characters and uh, players in this particular journey. Jesus led by the Spirit into a wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Amen. There's a lot going on just in that first that first verse, right? That Jesus, someone that we probably believe does pretty much everything right. Amen. <laughs> Amen was being led by the Spirit, God's, you know, personification, if you will, made real through the presence, the ruach, the, the breath of God in the world, the Spirit inhabiting and leading into a wilderness, a place many of us are often trying to run from. Amen. All right? You got somebody that does something right, being led by the one we say every day, Lord, please lead me. Amen. And then this, this prayer gets answered by you ending up in the wilderness. And you're just not in the wilderness by yourself because, you know, that could be in and of itself just, you know, some mess. But you are in the wilderness to be tempted. What? Now, I lived right. I prayed for direction. You led me into the wilderness. And now I'm here, and not only am I here, I'm being tempted. Then the last part of that verse, by the devil. Oh I mean, must I be tempted by the devil? Okay. I mean, I'd rather just be tempted by myself. Somebody say amen, right? You know, but the devil got to get in on this too, huh? So let me get this right. I'm living right. I am being led by God into a dry place to go through a trial, and the devil is there too. Somebody say, welcome to Lent, praise God. This is, <laughs> this, is, this is the journey, all right? This is the journey that we are finding ourselves in, and we'll keep reading. 
And Jesus fasted 40 days and 40 nights. And afterwards, he was famished. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command the stones to become loaves of bread. But Jesus answered, It is written, One does not live by bread alone but by every word, somebody say every word. every word, every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down. For it is written that God will command God's angels concerning you, and on their hands will they bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. Verse 7, Jesus said to him, again it is written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Okay. Verse number 8, again the devil, oh that old devil boy, he busy, right? <laughs> Took Jesus to a very high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And the devil said to Jesus, all these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. And Jesus said to the devil, away with you, Satan. That's what I say in my meetings with a lot of these progressives and politicians, amen. I would say to other folks, but I'm just not to meet with them, amen. Away with you, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Now, verse 11 is where we're going to really build pretty much all of our sermon from, but I thought it'd be great to give the background context for this because... Uh, it is indeed the case that you can be doing everything right and still have to go on a journey to learn what you don't know. And so verse 11 says, Then the devil left him, and suddenly angels came and waited on him. It's the word of God for us, the people of God. Let us say thanks be to God. Be to God. So we're going to talk from the topic, A Journey to Belong. God, I thank you for the word of God that has been read for us, the people of God. We ask you to hide this word in our hearts so we will not sin against you. And allow the preaching and teaching of the gospel that is made easy by your spirit be resting upon me. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the people of God say amen. amen. Lent is one of the most difficult parts of the Christian liturgical calendar because, particularly now, because it is hard to preach and teach and encourage people about a process of testing when you feel like you are already in a test. <laughs> amen. You know, sometimes the Gospels uh, meet us uh, and they agitate us and they attempt to, as one uh, person uh, said uh, in, a, in, a, in a prayer, I, I've heard that I hope to disrupt the comfortable. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the reality for many of us right now is we are in a perpetual state of discomfort. And sometimes this state of discomfort can cause us to retreat into isolation, internal, like just turn in radically internal. Uh, if you are a introvert, you can find yourself being more exhausted being around people, particularly when things are not going well, yeah. right? right? Uh -huh. And if you are extrovert, sometimes you try to put yourself intentionally in places because you get energy from yeah. things that are external to you. Yeah. But how many of you know that being an introvert or extrovert, there are moments in your life where neither of those will be the answer to the loneliness we feel. Amen. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I, I think about Jesus. I be wondering, like, if Jesus took a personality test, what would Jesus be? 
Well, Jesus be one of these people who's just like glad to be around everybody, you know. If we take Christian theological reflection seriously about Jesus, it's, it's, it's worth saying that, you know, Jesus was there at the beginning and in and, and his eternal form. Jesus is and was everywhere. So I guess in some respect, Jesus was already around everybody. <laughs> Jesus ain't just like surprised. He's like, oh, wow, you this way? No. I've seen you before a few millennia, eons ago. About a million of y'all acted this way in this particular circumstance, so I'm not surprised by you. But you do find throughout the course of Jesus' life that he had a rhythm of engagement and also a rhythm of disengagement. Jesus would spend time in community, and then he would pull back and say, you know, I need a fellowship with the creator, with my father, with God. I, 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 I like y'all and everything, but I need some time alone. Amen. Jesus would be on a boat with folks, and, 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 and everything be going upside down, and Jesus be down below, sleep, hanging out by himself. <laughs> Jesus seemed to be at in a place where he could, no matter where his external circumstance was, he had the ability to find peace. And yet, this particular passage gives us a very fascinating doorway into a stage of Jesus' development where he had to endure, he had to learn, and he had to depend on others to get him from his place of trial to a place of restoration. The scripture says that Jesus, as I you know, said many times already, led by the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil, the season of Lent, 40 days of us as a Christian community making a journey to Resurrection Sunday, appreciating that we don't get there without going through the cross. So we can already anticipate that we are on a journey, that the journey requires some struggle, and on the other side of the struggle, there is restoration, resurrection. But how many of you know that even if you know the end result, it does not take the edge off the journey. Lord, I don't have as much time as I would like to preach this, but I'll give you this, this small crude example, or not crude, insignificant, uh, maybe that's not a good word, uh, trivial, <laughs> trivial's good. You know, I, I, y'all know I went to the Super Bowl, and I watched the Super Bowl, and, and I, I didn't watch the Super Bowl again until early this week, because I just, Felt like being tortured again, I don't know. <laughs> Six minutes, Niners were still winning, and I remembered every high I had. Aww. Sitting up there just cheering me and my brother hugging each other, folks just hollering, they was playing, tell me when to go, tell me when to go. You know, everybody in the just going crazy, crazy, crazy. I knew that disaster was coming. Rewatching this game. It did not take the pain away. It felt like I relived it all over again. Even though I knew it was coming, something about my physiological, psychological, spiritual, emotional composition could not ward off the disappointment I knew was impending. I still had to go through the process of grief and loss and just dejection and being crushed to tears. The process. Well, I do believe that this last verse is a great opportunity for you and I as we're making a journey into belonging to appreciate what we must endure and go through if we are going to come out on the other side as a restored and whole community. Because there is a season of testing that many of us are in, will go through as a church, as a community, as a country, as all of creation, where we are acutely aware that things are not what they ought to be. We'll have that 
season in our relationships, in with our children, in our marriages, on our job, in our careers, while you're making your journey through school and college, in your ministry, in your own personal development, you will feel like, man, things are not what they should be. And yet, part of our task is not to retreat to the place of radical isolation. But we are to trust the process that if I continue to go through and be led by the Spirit, even when it leads me to the wilderness, I must trust that the Spirit will also lead me to community of restoration. So a few things that the Scripture lifts up that I think are worthy of our reflection. The first thing that the, the Scripture says is the devil left Jesus. The devil left him. And I think if we're going to endure and go through this season of challenge and season of struggle and season of trial, you must remind yourself constantly that you are stronger than your test. Mm. Pat yourself on the, on the chest and say, I am stronger than my test. I love how all of the testings and the trials and temptations that Jesus went through, Jesus outlasted the tempter. Jesus had to be stable and secure and serious about outlasting the very temptations that were brought to knock him off his journey. And in this setting of life, in this stage of life, I want you to hear the words of the, the writer James where he says, my brothers and sisters, my loved ones, my siblings, whenever you face trials of any kind, consider it nothing but joy. Now I, you know, one of these people that these, we don't know what these people be talking about. Like, who inspired you to write that? Amen. Must have been the same spirit that led you into the wilderness. Amen. Because you, just like you wouldn't go to the wilderness by yourself, you wouldn't write this by yourself, right? Amen. Consider it nothing but joy. Why? Because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its full effect so that you may be mature and complete lacking in nothing. It is indeed the case, my friend, that part of our journey to belonging requires us to outlast the test that cause you and I to isolate ourselves from one another. Trauma, anger, fear, and pain are usually the tools that are used by the tempter or by your trials to make you retreat, fall out of relationship with one another. I, I mentioned this some time ago that in the, 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 the country or the, the Great Britain, the, the kingdom, I guess, of Great Britain, because it's many countries, right? It's England and United Kingdom, thank you. They have started a ministry of loneliness because they did surveys across these countries and they found that 11 million or so people in the country are suffering from acute loneliness that drives people to despair and depression and even at times some bouts of suicidal ideation. And so they started, the government did a ministry of loneliness. How do we respond to a culture that creates isolation? Could it be that there are seasons you and I are navigating right now where we feel alone and isolated? And yet at the same time, I think there are opportunities for you and I, even as we endure our individual trials and tests, that we do not have to endure them in isolation. If it is indeed true that Jesus is leading, was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, there were 
angels waiting on the other side of his journey. That kind of leads me to my second point. But let me, let me just lift up the question for reflection for this first point. What pain, disappointment, and trial must you outlast to lean into a new community of belonging? How can you allow the trials you are dealing with to help catalyze you into a place of a new community and not a place of isolation. And along the way, how can you let Jesus outlast your devils so they just get tired enough to leave you? <laughs> Amen. I, I, that's become my philosophy, you know, when I was a little bit younger and had a lot more energy and a lot more, you know, vitriol. I used to like to fight the devil. Whenever I saw the devil, oh, come on, devil, let's, let's, and now I'm just outlasting the devil. <laughs> like, all right, I'm just going to stay faithful, stay consistent, because if I stay faithful and consistent, the devil can't hang with the power that sustains us. And so as you make your journey, are there devils and I'm not necessarily talking about just people. I'm talking about circumstances, environments, situations, hurt, trauma, anger, fear, pain, that you must outlast through the power of God's spirit. And how can you outlast these tests, trials, devils? So you can make it to a place of this next point, being surprised by God. I love this, 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 this just invocation of verse number 11, and suddenly angels came. I find that God is always looking to surprise you and I in ways that we could never expect. You and I often have a plan for how we're going to get out of our mess. We have a plan on how we're going to strategize. Even right now, some of us, you know, who are engaged in social justice efforts or you that are trying to put a lesson plan together for your, your kids or you that are going through therapy for your marriage or your children, you that are going to the doctor, you're doing everything you can to be responsible for what is within your charge. And then in the midst of your responsibility, God gives you a surprise. A suddenly. Anybody ever had a suddenly moment where you, you didn't expect that your deliverance, your power, your strength, and your help was coming suddenly? You thought it was coming from that way, and God brought it from that way. Lord, I wish I could talk to somebody in here today. In, 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 our, in our belong space, uh, the, the word used there is serendipity. It is this idea that, that the occurrence and development of events by chance can produce a happy or beneficial outcome. And, and I'm one of these people that believe that I and we should live our lives with a sense of holy serendipity. Yeah. That God, I know that if I can be faithful over the little you placed in my hands, that you will give me a divine surprise suddenly. I go to the doctor, they find out that I'm healed suddenly. I work on my job, I get the promotion suddenly. I'm dealing with Pookie and Ray Ray and the light comes on suddenly. I vote and I work for justice and I keep losing, but suddenly I experience the power and deliverance of God. Somebody holler suddenly. And you and I must be people who can look for the suddenly moments. That is how we maintain our hope suddenly. Suddenly make space for God to, to cheat a little bit on the rules you thought were fixed. Suddenly make space for God to blow your mind and to rewire some things that you thought were fixed. Suddenly helps you to have the ability to see those things that are not as though they are. When you're going through your season of trial, look for the suddenly moment. Because it's in the suddenly moments 
that you may have an experience that will make the trial worth it. Lord, have mercy. Give your neighbor a high five and tell him this trial can be worth it if I get a suddenly moment out of this thing. Amen. That, that's why you, Lord, I could preach on the suddenly all day long, but I got about 10 more minutes. But, but I want you to know that you and I can go through anything if we believe and expect that God will be with us through it. I can go through anything as long as I know God is with me. As long as I know God is carrying me. As long as I know that God is not going to allow my circumstance to, to win. God, I'm going to go through this thing. It don't mean I'm not going to cry. Don't mean I'm not going to complain. Don't mean I'm not going to kick a wall or two. <laughs> as long as you don't kick no people, amen. Don't put your hands on no people because you're going through. Amen. Doesn't mean that I'm not going to struggle, but God, as long as you are with me. And I love how sometimes the thing that gets in the way of us experiencing the suddenly moments is that we judge a situation too soon. We determine the end too soon. We put a period where God wants a comma. We, 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 put, we put an end where God is saying that ain't nothing but a doorway. God wants you to be open to suddenly moments. And the last thing before we take our communion, child of God, help is nearer than you think. Oh, somebody holler, help, help. is nearer than we think. Verse 11 says, and the angels ministered to Jesus. I want you to know, child of God, that there are some angels that are encamped around you and they are waiting to minister to you. They are waiting to remind you. They are waiting to help you. I love, I read this in a bunch of different versions, and one version said the angels ministered to Jesus. The other one said the angels helped Jesus. The other version said the angels waited on Jesus. So you got a minister, you got a waiter, and you got a helper. Pick whichever one you need right now. The Bible is telling you that while you are going through your trial, whatever you need to help you over this season, it is there at your disposal. Child of God, don't dare in this journey move to a place where you run away from your minister, run away from your angel, run away from your waiter, run away from your help. But God, I'm going to keep going through because I know at the end of this journey, God, that there's resurrection. There's restoration, there's help, there's power, there's strength, there's hope, there's everything I need to get through what I'm going through. And hear me on this, God will position you to be the receiver and the giver of the help and the hope and the strength you need. Uh, do I have a witness that can declare that God made me what I needed for somebody else? Uh, I thought that I needed to receive, but in my receiving, uh, I became a giver. Giver. I thought that I was going to be waited on, but in my getting waited on, I waited on somebody else. I thought that I was only going to get encouragement, but when I began to receive the encouragement of God, I began then to encourage other people. Child of God, as we go through this journey, make every effort in your mind to say, I refuse to throw in the towel. I refuse refuse to get off this journey I may have to shed a tear I may have to ask God some questions but I believe that the same God who that brought me into the wilderness will be the same God that'll bring me out on the other side and when I get there I see an angel I see some help I see some power I see some strength I didn't know existed somebody shout hallelujah stand with me everybody grab the hand of someone next to you there is a journey we are launching together that will require us to do some things we've not done before some of us if you're like me would rather struggle by yourself then link up with some folks and wrestle together.
But I want to declare and decree that as we get into this journey of Lent, as we go, be as we are being led by the Spirit into, and dare I say, through the wilderness to endure a test, a temptation, and a trial by the devil, your worst adversary. By faith, look for the sudden divine surprise and presence of ministering angels. Our belong groups are intended to be a constructed form of ministering angels. God, as we go through this season, may we not go through the season alone. But may we prioritize community. May we prioritize belonging and bridging and healing and wholeness. As I touch the person I am holding their hand today, I pray, God, that every step they take and every move that they make, Lord God, may it lead them to a place of restoration, of community, of wholeness. Do it for them, God. I squeeze their hand gently, Lord, because I want them to know that you are here with them, that together we can make it because our life is in your hands. And I pray that God, as we make this move, as we make this journey through Lent and some of our trials become perhaps more acute and more known to us, God, may we always be reminded that the help we have is nearer than we think. We are not left without a witness, without support, without ministry angels, without the presence of your power. So God, may we lean on that presence and that truth and that reality. Lift those hands right where you're standing and it's me, oh Lord, I stand in the need of prayer. It is not my mother, my father, my sister or brother, but it's me, God, and I need you. Somebody say, I need you, Lord. I need you to give me a suddenly experience. Turn a light on, flip a switch, Lord God. Give me a wink that just helps me to know that my work is not in vain. Lord God, on my job, with my family, with my career, with my education, with, Lord God, my entrepreneurship, Lord God, with all of these relationships, all of these, these physical, mental, uh, emotional challenges I'm facing, Lord God, just give me a divine wink, a divine surprise that says, I see you and I'm with you and everything is going to be all right. Help us, help us to know today that salvation has come to our house. Healing and deliverance has come to our house. Lord God, remind us, Lord, that we can make it. We can take it because we are yours and you are ours. And we'll say thank you, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Hook two or three people and tell them the journey is a journey to belonging. Tell them that a journey is a journey to belonging. Say, I know that I can make it. I know that I can stay. No matter, no matter what may come my way. My life is in. My life is in your hands. With Jesus, I can take. With Jesus, I can take. With Him, I know. With Him. everybody please stay right where you're sitting and standing we're going to receive the body and the blood of our lord and savior jesus christ the bible reminds us that on the day when jesus was betrayed he took the bread and he broke it and he said this bread is my body that has been broken for you as long as you eat it you are doing so in remembrance of me 
he took the cup that was filled with wine and he blessed it and he said this cup is the new covenant I make with you with my blood as long as you drink it you are doing so in remembrance of me for as long as you eat this bread as long as you drink this cup you are proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes again. We do this practice, this Eucharistic practice every first Sunday. Some Christian traditions do it every week. Some do it every other month. Some do it during only Easter or Christmas. But we do this because we want to keep reminding ourselves that we are God's body. Through all of our difference and challenges, our disagreements, we are God's body and Jesus died for the body. And this body needs us to be reminded of the brokenness that was required for we to be the body. The sacrifice needed for we to be the body. As we continue to be the body of Christ in this season of great challenge, may we always be reminded that even when we are broken and even when it feels we are sacrificed or being sacrificed, that there is resurrection and power that emerges from our faithfulness. And so as we come to receive the body and the blood of Jesus, I pray that you come in the spirit of both unity and faithfulness and solidarity, that the blood of Jesus is the great uniter. It is that which transcends our difference. It is that which transcends our time, our geography. It is that which holds us together. And so stretch your right hand forward and let's pray a blessing on these elements. God, I thank you for while we were yet in our sins, Jesus died for us. And I thank you, Lord, that you did not allow us to be left to our own devices, but you solved the problem. And so today, God, we come and we remind ourselves that the body that is your bread and the blood that is your wine, it is that brokenness and that sacrifice that has resulted in a divine surprise of salvation, of unity, of spirit, of grace, and of power. Bless these elements today. May they have the same power they had on the night when you gave it to your disciples. And we will thank you, God, for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the people of God say amen. amen. If you are a follower of Jesus, I invite you to face the outer walls. Come and receive the bread and the wine. Take it back to your seats and together as an act of unity, Christian unity, we will receive the body and the blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The body and the blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ for me. that has been broken and shed for you. Receive it, receive it, receive it. Way back.
Savior Jesus Christ that has been broken for us. Because of the wounds in the body of Jesus, we are healed, so eat in victory. Thank you, Jesus. And this is the blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ that has been shed for us. Though our sins be red as crimson, the blood of Jesus washes us cleaner than snow, drink in victory. Hallelujah. Come on, lift those hands and just say thank you, Lord. Come on, take a few moments. Tell the Lord we thank. Thank you, Lord. Oh, God, we say thank you, Lord. Tell the Lord that I just want to thank you. Let's do one more verse. Tell the Lord you've been so good. You've been. over my life God say I just want everything you've done for me say I just want to thank thank you Lord come on and give God a few moments of some thanks today God we thank you we bless you we magnify your name today we exalt you hallelujah we give you the glory and the praise in Jesus name God bless you, people of the way. We love you with the love of the Lord. I pray that you have a week of great blessing. I pray that every trial, every circumstance you endure, be reminded you are not alone. And to amplify that point on your way out, sign up for one of these groups. Look at the days and the options. And even if you don't know, if you can commit, just sign up and let someone follow up with you and make an introduction. But let's spend the next four or five weeks really building some deep relationships with one another. I think on the other end of this, you may come out with a serendipitous friend, a serendipitous sojourner, someone, something that you had not expected that will surprise and blow your mind for the journey ahead in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Amen.